Hello, everyone, and welcome to PASA's webinar, an inside look at primate releases. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Thank you. I see lots of great names showing up here. So good morning and good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. We're so glad you're here. Hi, Karen. Uh, we've had a, a slight change in plans uh, with our webinar. Um, very unfortunately, Rebecca Atencia from Chimpunga and the Jane Goodall Institute was scheduled to be with us. Uh, sadly, she is quite sick and couldn't be with us today. So we're sending her a big PASA virtual hug and we hope she gets better very quickly. And uh, we miss her and we hope to bring her to you soon, as soon as she's ready. Um, however, we've got Pam Cunnyworth from Colobus Conservation in Kenya. Uh, and she's ready to share some great stories and wonderful information about how uh, Colobus has been uh, pioneering monkey releases. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. We are recording this, it's, uh, it'll be shared out. So if for some reason you miss something or you have to drop off early or you wanna share it with friends or whatever, uh, we will have that for you in the next day or so. Um, hi, Ian. Great to see you. I'm just looking at the chat. So feel free to say hello and introduce yourself um, and where you're where you're coming in from. Uh, we've got people from all around the world and it's so excited to be with you uh, here at the beginning of the year, a whole new year. Um, so let me go ahead and bring up my PowerPoint, start sharing my screen so you get to see all of how the sausage gets made here for a second. But what tasty sausage it is, right? Here we go, ta-da. So without further ado, we'll get into this. Um, so I am Jean Fleming, I'm with PASA, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. We're gonna be talking about primate releases. Primate, we'll be mainly focusing on monkeys since we got uh, Pam with us, so that's her area of specialty. Uh, we're going to talk about the different variables that go into releasing a, what, monkeys into the wild. We'll have time for questions. Should be a great discussion. Uh, just a little bit about PASA. If you're not familiar with us, we are the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. We were created in 2000 by a group of uh, visionary sanctuary leaders who came together and realized they had common issues uh, that they could solve better together. Um, and we, since that time, we've grown to be 23 different members in 13 different countries across Africa. We're the largest such alliance uh, in Africa, and we're proud of all of our members. Um, the work is really about uh, deep, being deeply embedded in the communities. Our members have decades of experience uh, all across in Western Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa. Um, and they have created programs that not only care for rescued animals and uh, reintroduce them to the wild, but also address the, the really challenging, deep challenging threats that they're faced with habitat loss, climate change, poaching, uh, you name it, it's coming at them and they deal with it all uh, with an incredible spunk and very few resources, especially these last few years while we've had the COVID pandemic, it's been a very difficult time for them, but they have uh, gotten through with a lot of help from generous uh, donors all around the world. And we're so grateful for that. Um, a little bit about the impact we've had over 20 years in that time, we've rescued more than 4,000 uh, great apes and monkeys uh, and many other animals as well. There's a great gray parrot rescues going on. There's uh, pangolins, many other animals are involved, but our, our members are primarily focused on primates. Uh, they employ over 8, 800 people, not 8,000, 
uh, across Africa, mostly African nationals, uh, returning $6 million annually about into the economies locally. Uh, and together, uh, they've conserved over 150,000 uh, acres of wild land, which is amazing. Um, so let's turn our attention to the, the topic at hand, which is releases. Uh, in 2021, our members, uh, PASA's 23 members, reintroduced about 400 animals back into the wild. Um, this is a combination of uh, primates, chimps, uh, monkeys, and also um, other species. And then they, uh, in addition, they monitor about a little over 700 animals uh, in the wild. So it's, it's quite extensive. And Pam is going to take us into the ins and outs of uh, what really goes into a release. Um, they're complex and costly operations. Um, we often see the, the beautiful and very inspiring moment when an animal is released. Uh, however, a lot of hard work goes into that moment. Um, there's veterinary care, there's a site visits and, and auditing going on to see where it actually could release an animal. Uh, you have to get the animal there in some cases, um, and then of course monitoring after they're, they're released. Um, and with that, I'm gonna ask Pam to take it over and she can tell some stories and share some great information. And Pam may decide that she wants to turn her video off just because of bandwidth issues in uh, Kenya where she's located. So if that happens, you can trust that she's, uh, she's with us, but just wants to preserve her, her internet. Just checking that you can see my initial screen. Yes, we can. Thank you, Pam. Okay, great. So these are the titles of the current body of literature on the procedures and methods of primate releases. You can see that it's quite limited, but luckily it's growing annually. When I started planning the releases of the primates at Columbus Conservation in 2003, these were the only publications available to me at that time. But of these, only three describe the releases of monkeys. And not a single publication was available describing African monkey releases. Hello, my name is Pam Cunnyworth. Over the last 20 years, I've been overseeing the Columbus Conservation Primate Welfare Response Team. We've responded to almost 3,000 calls from community members in Southeast Kenya. And today we are talking about releases and it has been a journey. The big takeaway is that one size does not fit all, meaning that we had to develop a unique protocol for each of Diani's six species of primates. Diani is a suburban area, and remarkably, there are 1,500 monkeys living within the seven square kilometer town, so about three square miles. There are literally monkeys on every corner. So Diani is in the southeast corner of Kenya, and it lies parallel to the Indian Ocean. It's an international tourist resort town so there is indigenous trees and forest interspersed amongst the hotels, shops, and residential areas. So as I mentioned, Diani has six primate species, and this is really unusual for a suburban area. So a bit of taxonomy here. So we have six primates, two are Galago species, and these are the primitive primates. We also have baboons, vervets, Sykes monkeys, which are circopithecines, and colobus is a colobine. Circopithecines and colobines are two distinct types of monkeys with a number of unique characteristics. So notably though, the colobines are leaf-eating monkeys, whereas the others are omnivorous, so they eat a wide range of foods. 
They also vary in their size, habitat preference, with some being more terrestrial, so more um, on the ground, and others being more arboreal, preferring the trees. So through our work, we receive wild orphans and former pets, and many of these need hand rearing. So for example, in this case, the mother was struck by a vehicle, but the infant survived. And in Kenya, it's illegal to have a primate as a pet. So we work with the authorities on confiscations. So when the individuals are ready, after they've been brought to Colobus Conservation, perhaps they need a veterinary care or some of the pets have some behavioral issues, but when they're ready, they're integrated into species specific enclosures and our pre-release protocols begin. So as I mentioned, one size does not fit all when we consider releases. So let me start with the Galagos. So we have two species of Galagos. One is very small, about half a kilo at maturity, while the other is a, a, a kilo and a half, about three pounds. As primitive primates, they're nocturnal and, and they eat insects. So we started developing Galago release protocols by conducting a census in Diani for both species. And as these are nocturnal species, much of our work was based on, on vocalizations. That is the dwarf galago, and this is the greater galago. So you can tell they're both galagos, but they clearly have a, a similar structure to the coal, but they are different. So we were able to, to do the census based on the coals with some visuals. And we mapped our census results and created these uh, heat maps, these population maps, where the darker the color, the more observations were made. That was uh, another one. Um, so another consideration of the release protocol, uh, we first of all need to know where they are in Diani, and that's the census. And, but the second part is that both species, the two species use different parts of the habitat. So the greater galago lives higher in the canopy and the dwarf galago in the lower canopy. So our, re our galago release protocol is then based on finding a wild population of that species based on information from our census maps and a near adjacent suitable habitat. So, for the dwarf galago, that release location, of course, has to have lower canopy, and the greater galago has to have available upper canopy. The release location should not have wild individuals, but it should have a corridor that leads to the wild population. So why we do this is that what we found is that these individuals, because they lack experience in the wild, this provides them with with time, time to learn how to forage, how to, uh, how to move about the environment, jumping back and forth, what to do in a rainstorm. So this gives them time to adjust. And when they themselves feel ready, they can make their way through the corridor to the wild population by following the vocalizations. So these are some of the individuals we've released. So the next species is the yellow baboon. There are almost 300 baboons within the town. However, we rarely receive wild orphans or former pets. And because of this, we're, we can't make a, a social group of baboons for release. So it's unethical to keep an individual of a social species on its own. And because baboons are predators of the other primates in Diani, 
we can't do mixed species groups. And we can't even keep baboons near our other primates who are undergoing rehabilitation for release because we don't want them habituated to the presence of baboons. So we have spent a lot of time discussing our options. And so this is just for the wild orphans and, and former pets we're discussing because for baboons that come in because they're injured or, or ill, then we have a veterinary clinic where we uh, give them care and release them back to the group where, where they originated from. So given our limited options for baboons, we found other Kenyan sanctuaries willing to take the individuals and integrate them into, the current, into their current baboon sanctuary population. So for burbots, this is the most frequent species of wild orphans and former pets that Colobus Conservation receives. So after hand rearing, they enter the nursery group and begin interacting with the individuals that they will eventually be released with. And from there, the nursery group is slowly integrated into the main burbot group. They are provided with a complex enclosure and daily enrichment, which focuses on increasing foraging time. So we try to get that the foraging time as long as possible, attempting to recreate their, their time budgets in the wild. So between the enclosure and the enrichment, this gives the, the vervets opportunities to develop their natural behaviors. And one really important thing is to provide them with unsteady structures. Uh, we've seen in other releases at, um, from other sanctuaries, um, and also we've observed wild monkeys falling. So falls are not unusual, so we need our vervets to have those skills prior to release. So during the months prior to the release, each individual is tested for behaviors which are considered necessary for post-release survival. And one of these is appropriate responses to predators, such as baboons, as I mentioned, and also domestic dogs. So what we expect is for all the animals to do alarm calls and go to the top of their enclosure when baboons come by or a domestic dog comes by. And when we go through the, the protocols of, of pre-release, they're also fitted with radio collars and ear tags. And then once they're released, they're monitored by researchers and volunteers for at least one year. Over the first three months, we provide them with supplemental food if they, if they require it, and we always provide veterinary care. So in 2012, we achieved high rates of survivorship one, one year post-release. And the percent of survivorship was comparable to the wild groups that we were also studying alongside that release program. And we had adult females giving birth during that, that one year as well. So we considered the release a success except for one main hurdle. On release, the vervets were being aggressive to the staff members. So at that point, we had to begin investigating how to resolve that. Luckily, one of our volunteers was a pediatric occupational therapist working with special needs children. And with a grant from PASA, Petra returned to Colobus Conservation to help us find a solution to this aggression to the staff after the release. So the first thing she did is she videoed our work around the enclosures. And together her and I reviewed these videos and we saw, we saw instantly what the issue was.
Oops. So you see that Tony is going about his work on the other side of the enclosure. He's not promoting any interaction with the vervid infants and the infants are unafraid of him. So we had our, our, our typical way of being around our monkeys in the cages is neutral. We're not, we're pretending to be invisible to them. So we're not interacting with them at all. But when, when Petra and I reviewed this video, we saw that this neutrali neutrality was being viewed by the monkeys as subordinate. They were completely unafraid. They were completely habituated to very close interactions with the staff members. And the staff members didn't do anything except being neutral. So where this was a big problem in the 2012 release with a lot of aggression directed to the staff, we started putting together a dehabituation program and because these burbits are infants now, but they will be released as juveniles or even perhaps sub-adults. And when we get former pets in, often they're older sub-adults or even adults. So when you have completely unafraid, over-habituated animals in the presence of the staff after release, this creates a very risky situation. So the dehabituation was going from being neutral behaviors towards the monkeys or neutral, um, our presence is neutral around the monkeys to using our body language to be dominant over the monkeys, to be assertive over the monkeys. We know that the aggression by post-release monkeys is um, a, we have heard it from other sanctuaries around the world, even in Asia and South America, that this is often the case. So this is a really important um, methodology that we would like to share. So in 2019, we, we released 11 vervets and six months prior to the release, we started the dehabituation process. And after release, we did not have a single encounter of aggression from the vervets towards the staff. And notably, all 11 individuals survived one year post-release. As vervets and Sykes monkeys belong to the same tribe taxonomically, we thought that the release protocols would be the same. Surprisingly, they are very different but it took us up till about a year and a half ago to understand how they are different. So vervets need to be released as a group. And importantly, no other ver vervet group can be in the area. We tried that once, we released a vervet group to our local home range group of vervets so both groups knew each other and knew each other well, but they fought on release. So we took the, the release group back into the enclosure. And then we worked on removing the vervet group from, from the Colobus Conservation property because we were releasing from the, the pre-release enclosure directly onto our property. So when the wild group came around, we gently pushed them off the property and got them to to move on, move on their way. So in that way, when we we're able to release the vervets onto the property, they don't meet up with the wild vervets immediately. But Sykes monkeys, what we found is that they can be released individually. So we've observed individuals of all ages integrate into the Sykes monkey home group within hours of release. Uh, this is extraordinary. And there are, of course, many benefits for this, that the individuals don't, stay, don't have to stay in captivity for very long. And the home group teaches the individuals what to forage, how to forage, when to forage, how to avoid predators, where the sleeping sites, 
and just how to go about the environment in general. So we recently released a weaned infant into the group and he is doing well, um, I think for about three months into it. So this is the 2019 release and these are Sykes monkeys coming out of the enclosure for the first time. And just minutes after being released. On the left, we have one of our releases from 2019, Chale. And here she is with her GSM collar. So we were able to track her on the computer when we didn't see her visually. Then in the middle photograph, this is her one year post release with the collar removed and she is visibly pregnant. And then on the right is with her newborn about 14 months post release. And lastly, Colobus. This black and white Colobus species is vulnerable to extinction. And Diani's Colobus, the population is important for main, maintaining the Colobus meta population of Kenya. So over the years, we have found abandoned colobus infants on the ground, surprisingly uninjured. So, so they weren't, apparently they're, they're not a result of infanticide or attempted infanticide. So this is our veterinarian having just received a newborn infant that was just found on the ground. So in cases like this, once we give the infant a check over. We start searching the area where the infant was found, looking for a group to where, to where it belonged. However, the group in the vicinity of the infant is not always the infant's group. So we, we learned this through trial and error. So on one occasion, we presented the infant, the infant to a, a nearby group where the infant was found. An adult male came out of the tree, took the infant from us, took it up to the tree and threw it to the ground. But luckily the infant bounced and was unharmed. We quickly gathered it up and we continued looking for another group. We found a group much further away and we presented the infant to the group. And this time an adult female came down retrieved the infant and cuddled and nursed the infant. And so we knew that we had found the mother. So now part of the, the release protocols is if an adult male comes out of the tree, you grab the infant and you run with it. Oops, sorry. Mm. Sorry, it's not the uh, video is not going on. Here it is.
So we're not sure why these infants are appearing on the ground unharmed. Uh, there's two possibilities. One is that the two groups, two colobus groups have had a, a, a fight, an interaction. And while the mo mother is jumping about getting chased or chasing, that the she takes big jumps. And the, and the infant is dislodged and falls to the ground. And then during the, the ruckus of the interaction, the groups move apart and the mother doesn't know where the infant is. Secondly, we have um, a student in Diani now, and she is looking at colobus infants and she's recording falls regularly. So she's looking at five infants right now and four of which have fallen to the ground over the past um, two months. So we're not sure exactly why this is happening. Um, hopefully over the next year, we'll have more information. So almost 20, 20 years on from my first days of trying to work out how to release the six species of primates in the Annie, we now have protocols. We're still developing them and there's still so much more to learn. So people used to say to me many years ago, why don't you just go and ask people how to release them? Which my response was, no one knows. There isn't anyone to ask. So now we want to share our experiences so that other conservation managers won't be in the same position I was in many years ago. So if you ever find yourself in Kenya, please visit us in Diani. So from our staff and volunteers at Columbus Conservation, thank you for taking time to listen to our stories today. And of course, the release protocols were developed by a, a large team of people within Colobus Conservation, directors, management, researchers, and volunteers. And in, in, in addition, we have had lots of discussions among past the sanctuary managers. And among the many, many, many people who were involved, there are key people to the protocol development who I want to say a special thank you to. Andrea Donaldson, James Ra Mukundi, Petra Lessinger, Amy Lacey, Nancy Munganya, Zoe Edwards, Samantha Palmer, and, and Kuhn Benchies. And these people whose fieldwork and analyses gave us a lot of insight into progressing our protocols further. If you'd like to join our mailing list, please send us an email. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. That's, a, that's amazing. Uh, and really appreciate the, the thorough look, taxa by taxa, uh, at species to see the, the different protocols and how they work for you there. Um, I'm definitely opening it up to questions from the audience or any of uh, our other panel for Caitlin, if she's got any. Uh, but I'm gonna kick it off with a few of my own. Um, I was curious to hear you talk about um, how you evaluate whether or not an animal actually is a good candidate for release. Um, surely some are and some aren't. So maybe you could talk about what goes into the, that kind of decision-making and what that looks like for you. And um, we have a series of, of behavioral criteria that we have a checklist, we go out, we and then we, we try different things with them, such as bringing a dog around. And each individual has to behave appropriately. Um, obviously, if an animal stays on the ground and isn't behaving appropriately, then they would have to be, usually they're not, they're just shifted to the next release. Uh, we wouldn't ever consider an animal unreleasable as long as it was physically able to be released. And even animals we've seen in missing like a half an arm or a foot from perhaps electrocution, 
uh, we see them regularly surviving in the wild. So as long as they're fit, we try to, you know, we give them that opportunity. Because we have researchers observing them, in the beginning, they're with them 12 hours a day. Um, so if anyone needs assistance or is not coping well, then they're captured, they're brought back into the enclosure and they're put into the next release, giving them more time to adjust. Thank you. And how, you talked a little bit with, um about the, the site selection and kind of making sure there's a corridor that they can go to so that as they get more comfortable, uh, how does that work for some of the other species and, and what happens if you can't find a good release site? How does that work? I think release sites are um, a problem for a lot of sanctuaries. There's fewer and fewer areas to put them and if you find a good release site now, that release site then becomes full. And to add another group, and then another group, and then another group over the years, um, there's, there's challenges to that. So you, you do have to explore, and each time you think you have a new site, you, you have to start at, the scra at, at scratch, where you have to go and find out how many of that species is there, how many, um, you don't want to overpopulate an area. Um, for Sykes monkeys, because we're now going, instead of putting a group out at any one time, we're doing individuals. We don't know how long we can do that for before the group is full of uh, released individuals um, and then there's no, moms to look after the, the infants. So these are these protocols are far from finished. We're still considering them. For each release that we do, we learn something new and then we adjust our protocol. So we would never consider a protocol finished. Great, thank you. It looks like we've got some questions coming in. Um... This one is coming to us from Kelly O'Meara, our new executive director for PASA. Um, so she is asking about the tactics that are used to deter the wild population of vervet monkeys from staying nearby the release sites. Uh, Pam, you mentioned moving them away so that they can be newly released can be safe. How do you, how do you accomplish that? Yeah, it's Indiana because it's a suburban town. Everyone in the town knows how to move, move monkeys because monkeys come onto your veranda. So everyone knows you just go out, you wave your arms, you, you know, <laughs> clap your hands, you, you know, shake around. And monkeys in Diani know when they're not wanted and then they move off. But for us, it's, it, we have to do it consistently. It's not possible to do it one day and then allow them in the next day because what we're attempting to do is make sure that the wild population doesn't find the Colobus conservation property as part of its home range. So, so we're constantly pushing them off. So what happened when we released the last vervet group in 2019 is in fact, our, the release group left the property after about three days and met up with the, vervet, the wild vervet group. So, it was interesting because the release group had an adult male with it. And as soon as the release group met up with the wild group, the adult male left <laughs> he never joined, he never came back to the group after that, which the resident male of the wild group was very happy about that. And so then there was a slow transition with those individuals. And in the end, we had a number of wild vervets join our group including wild adult females, which nobody had, had thought that that was possible. So we learn something new every time. I have a question, Pam. Uh, how do you get, could you talk a little bit about getting buy-in from the local community? Like, do, these, do they see these monkeys as pests? And is there then an issue that you're um, reintroducing them and sort of building up populations in the 
while, <laughs> which is the suburbs. Yeah, so all of our, I, I would say about 95% of our released monkeys come from Diani. So we're not introducing new monkeys to the area. So these are individuals that our emergency response team goes out when we get a community call of perhaps a monkey's been hit by a car or electrocute, electrocuted. Our team goes out, brings that individual back. And so if we have an animal, um, as I showed you the, the photograph, the mother dies, we have the infant, um, and then they go into our care, but then they're released just back into the environment. So the numbers don't change over over Diani, it's not that we're taking uh, individuals from across Kenya and repopulating that area. Thank you. Um, another question, this one is from Jenny, Jenny Bodding. Um, do you think some species are better candidates uh, or adapt better to reintroductions than others, or is it just a case of figuring out the best protocol for each? Clearly, there's at least we have six species with six different protocols. Um, I, I think we're in a unique position, which is in the suburban area. I was talking to another sanctuary member who received some similar arboreal guenins, such as our Sykes monkeys. Um, but they have the challenges where they will be releasing back to the wild, where those guenons will be in 50 meter trees. And where our individuals know the wild groups because the wild groups live on our property. So they're already playing and grooming through the, through the enclosure before the release. So, so there's challenges from from the different sites, uh, suburban area versus a wild area. So are we able to, some of our sanctuary managers are releasing into national parks and that will be our next step is to look how many, whether we release our vervets into a national park, we have to consider that, but other sanctuary members are doing that. So yeah, there are so many questions. Um, on how to do these releases. Even though we've, we've answered a bunch, there's still many more to come. Uh, we've got a question from Alison White. Uh, she's asking, do you do any outreach work with the community, we primate conservation or habitat conservation? Maybe speak a little bit to uh, your programs that, that connect with the community. Yeah, so all our work has a community component. Um, we are, Unfortunately, at the beginning of COVID, we had some crop rating monkeys in some of the communities around Diani. We spent a lot of time working with them because they, they were angry at the monkeys for taking their food, their crops, especially because of the loss of jobs within Diani because it's a tourist sector. So they were doing unimaginable things to, to monkeys in retaliation. So we spent a lot of time with them. We work with schools. We have a school program. Of course, that's reduced because of COVID, but normally we would have a, a, a school group visiting us uh, once a week from schools all across our Colobus area. Um, we, we, uh, we learn about the, the traditional songs and uh, sayings about the wildlife and and we work with uh, we go off into the communities we show them the passive film called Ayani it's a beautiful series of a young Kenyan boy a young African boy uh, saving gorillas and forests and we show that to the communities so we do a lot of outreach um, of course primate conservation forest conservation can't happen unless you have community outreach. They go hand in hand. Absolutely. Um, one additional question that's come in is, um, 
how do you go about recapturing individuals if you need to do that? I think you mentioned that if, if you could see somebody was not thriving in the wild, you can, you can bring them back in. Our teams are expert at capturing monkeys. That's, that's what they do. Every time we've had almost 3,000 community calls, so which means that when we go out, if an animal is up the tree with a compound fracture, we have to dart that animal bring it to the veterinary clinic. If there is another animal who's on the ground, uh, we set up traps. Peanuts are a good bait for monkeys, uh, sunflower seeds. Um, yeah, a free easy meal is always good. You have nice big cages. Our, our teams have been doing this for since Colobus Conservation started, so they're experts at this. Um, oh, go ahead, Caitlin. Um, I, I had a question about bushmeat. Uh, is it an issue in Deany at all? It, there is some bushmeat going on. It is, Kenya is not, uh, I know other areas of Africa, bushmeat is a big problem. In Kenya, it's not a big problem but we don't want it to become a big problem. So we do know, we have, um, of course we know what's going on in our area. People are um, killing baboons and using that meat and mixing it with cattle meat, with beef and selling it um, as beef. Um, so when we find, a, find out about these, we alert the authorities on that. Um, we do want to put out information on bushmeat, uh, try to keep everybody safe. Um, so that's part of our, our plans as well. We've got a question uh, about the Galagos. Um, for the animals that are nocturnal, uh, do you have a nocturnal routine with them uh, before the release? Um, how do you manage differences in taking care of nocturnal and diurnal animals? And, and Sarah also adds, thank you so much. She loved the presentation. Okay, thank you. So we have an enclosure set up for the Galagos and um, so that they sleep during the day and we've got special boxes for them to sleep in. And then they do their thing. We feed them uh, at the end of our day, at the beginning of their day. Um, we capture, um, insects for them and we put them in the cage so that they're able to um, start learning how to jump around and catch live insects. Um, there are challenges uh, about how to track them after release because once we release them, um, people, we've had one person who's, who's living at a property who was able to tell us whether they saw the individual or not but it's, it's, it's a suburban setting. So it's not that people can wander around after dark following, following animals. So um, we're looking at different kind of transmitters, um, radio collars, but they're such small animals and especially the dwarf galago um, to put on any kind of collar, you know, that, that's tricky. So we're just waiting for some of those technologies to get smaller and smaller. And I, I think within the next few years, we'll have something that we can actually put on them to track them long-term. Yeah, yeah. And um, maybe you can just spend a moment sharing um, what the COVID pandemic has been like for your organization. Uh, I know it's been a very difficult time and this is a chance to just share uh, a little bit of what that's been like, maybe tell a story or two about that. Um, mo most of our finances come through volunteers and researchers, um, eco tours, and people come, so we give them a one hour eco tour, we have a little shop, and with COVID overnight, we drop down to about 5% of our income. So um, it's been very, very difficult. 
we our programs are set up at the the least cost possible so through very kind donations we've been able to make ends meet on a month to month basis um, people have had their salaries cut um, and that was a staff decision to do that yeah it's um it's been very difficult but we have no choice but to continue um yeah and we just make it up by the end of the month somehow um we're we're lucky we are seeing some tourists returning um so we are getting some eco tours through so yeah yeah, it's been it's been tough. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are so grateful for the work that you're doing and the, uh, the lives that you're saving there. It's an incredible challenge, obviously, um, and you do it with dedication and, and love. And we're um, thankful that you could share your stories with us um, for for those of you who are interested in supporting this work. Um, you can visit PASA.org and we can make a donation on, on your behalf to Colobus. So I'd encourage you to, to share if you can. Obviously, a little goes a long way. And um, all of the member sanctuaries of PASA are able to, to make miracles happen on a very small budget. And, uh, and your generosity is uh, incredibly appreciated every day there. So we thank you, Pam, so much for uh, the, the work you're doing and for taking time to share it with us. Um, ah, and Caitlin has shared the link there in the chat for those of you who want, want to just get right in there and do it now. So we, we'd be very grateful. Uh, and for everybody else, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope uh, to come back at you with Rebecca soon. Um, and we'll be doing more webinars and sharing stories of primates as we go. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Pam. And we'll see you the next time. Super. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.